I first got elected to Congress, I was elected in the year that Lyndon Johnson was elected president, 1964. But I had never really had very much uh, acquaintance with uh, uh, Vice President uh, Johnson. And I was sitting in the lounge at Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., and a United agent came on board and said, is there Congressman Foley on board? And I raised my hand. Congressman Thomas Foley, yes. Congressman Thomas S. Foley of Washington, I said, yes, that's me. And then in a very loud voice, he said, Mr. Congressman, President Johnson is calling for you urgently. Please come with me, we will hold the lounge. Well, frankly, I was pretty impressed because I don't think I'd formally been introduced to the president. And with the fact that he was calling me, you know, what, was he, what was he calling me about? What did he want me to do or whatever? And of course, everybody in the lounge was kind of impressed too. It was a big deal. So we walked through, the, the agent and I walked through the terminal and he was kind of pushing people aside, you know, kind of make way for the commissioner style. And I got inside the office, which was between two ticket counters. And there were three or four people working there and he kind of made them all leave, and out, out. So, and then he sort of bowed himself out and shut the door and I saw this telephone with the phone off the hook and I picked it up. And uh, the voice on the other end said, uh, Congressman Foley, I said, yes, Thomas Foley, Thomas Foley of Washington, yes. Uh, Mr. Congressman, this is the White House switchboard. Would you hold now for the president? And a few seconds later, a familiar Texas voice comes on the line and said, John. And I said, no, Mr. President, Tom Foley. And I can't say this at the table, it'd be a little impolite to do, but there followed a string of four-letter words that would make a sailor blush, as the line goes, ending with uh, <clears throat> a long uh, four-letter word pronounced in two syllables beginning with S, which said, I wanted John Fogarty of Rhode Island, not you. And the phone was hung up. It was the most depressing moment of my political career up to that point, and I was literally kind of shaking. And then I had still had the smoking habit, so I smoked a couple of cigarettes and sort of calmed down. And suddenly I realized I had a brilliant thought. You know, nobody else knows, just the president and me and one poor White House telephone operator who was probably catching hell for it because they have a reputation for getting the right person wherever he or she is. And so I squared my shoulders and I walked out and the agent outside, the United agent said, have you finished your conversation with President Johnson? And I could truthfully say, yes, the president and I have finished our conversation. So he walked back to the lounge with me, rode out to the plane with me, whispered in the ear of the flight attendant, please upgrade Mr. Foley from economy to first class at the convenience of United Airlines. He has just had a very important conversation with the president of the United States. Those were the days when a wrong number <laughs> could get you upgraded. Members don't really get acquainted uh, across the aisle and across party lines. I decided, uh, it was uh, I guess the 102nd Congress, to suggest that Democrats uh, do two things. Uh, one is that if they hadn't thought about doing it, that maybe they ought to very soon in their career miss a vote. Not an important vote, not a significant vote for their district, but perhaps some procedural vote. So that they will never be tempted to try to have a 100% voting record, which if they stay a long time is not really a signal of good service, but more like kind of perfect attendant is to a, to a grade school student. It doesn't mean you're a good scholar. And the other thing I suggested was to take a trip, you know, because if they hadn't pledged never, never to do it, that uh, travel for legitimate reasons in the Congress to learn more about our operations in other parts of the country or other parts of the world was also a way to get to know Republicans. And because we sit on opposite sides of the aisle, we uh, sit at different tables even in the private dining room often, and there's just very little chance to, to understand that there, as I said to the members, there are great, great Republican members in the House. You will find if you get to know them that they're fully as committed to the country's future as you are. <laughs> and you may, if you want a political reason, think about the fact that you'll get a vote from across the aisle sometime later on in your career for no other reason than you took a trip together and you got acquainted and something that's not important to that Republican and very important to you results 
in some help. Anyway, there was a reporter there, and uh, the AP the next day said that I had given the members of the 102nd Congress the advice of uh, miss a vote and take a junket. And, uh, and one of our famous uh, uh, national uh, television networks, Fair and Balanced, said the, the, <laughs> the next day that they were shocked, shocked that the Speaker of the House had told uh, the new members to miss as many votes as they could, but never miss a chance to take a publicly financed trip to vote. <laughs> then as now, we have uh, the newly elected members, both Republicans and Democrats, meet ahead of time in December usually, and they come to have orientation about their new responsibilities. And I remember when I had uh, joined this big class in 1964 election of Democrats, and John McCormick was speaker, and he um, greeted us all in this special caucus meeting. And, said that uh, the leadership wasn't going to really pay too much attention to us in the first two years, the newly elected, because he didn't know and they didn't know whether we had been elected by accident, perhaps, rather than as a deliberate act of the electorate. So they would wait until we were re-elected. And then if we were re-elected, they would start to believe that maybe there was something serious about our future in the House. That was kind of a cold shower. After uh, the speaker's uh, somewhat cool greeting, to give us some idea of what we ought to do and how we ought to behave. And one of them was Mike Kerwin, who was a very powerful member of the Appropriations Committee. He wanted to warn us against the single greatest danger that could accrue to a new member. So we leaned forward and uh, he said, that danger is thinking for yourselves. For heaven's sakes, he said, don't do that. He said, trust the subcommittee chairman, trust the committee chairman, trust the chairman of the Democratic caucus, trust the Democratic whip, trust the majority leader, the Democratic leader of the House, and especially, he said, pray God, trust, respect, and follow the speaker. I remember being really annoyed. I'd gotten elected, I thought, to make some contribution to the future of the country in whatever way I could, and here's a senior member of the Democratic Party telling us that we really ought to pay no attention to our own ideas, but only to the kind of leaders of the party. And then he went on to make it worse by saying that, uh, you know, he thought in his experience that more people had gotten in trouble in the Congress thinking for themselves than by stealing money. And I thought, this is outrageous, just outrageous. In the ensuing years, I became a subcommittee chairman and a committee chairman and the chairman of the Democratic Caucus and the Democratic Whip and the Democratic majority leader. And finally, in 1989, I became the speaker. And I remember taking the oath of office as speaker, the wise words of Mr. Kerwin came back over a generation of time. Trust, respect, and follow the speaker. 